Good morning, church. Welcome to everyone in worship today. Let us continue our acts of worship with our thanksgiving for baptism. Please stand as you're able. Alleluia, Christ is risen. In the waters of baptism, we have passed over from death to life with Jesus Christ. And it, we are a new creation for his saving mystery. And for this water, let us bless God who is, who was, and who is to come. We thank you, God, for the river of life. Freely flowly from your throne, through the earth, the city, through every living thing. You rescued Noah and his family from the flood. You opened wide the sea for the Israelites. Now in these waters you flood us with mercy, and our sin is drowned forever. You open the gate of righteousness, and we pass safely through. In Jesus Christ, you calm and trouble the waters. You nourish us and enclose us in safety. You call us forth and send us out. In lush and barren places, you are with us. You, are, you have become our salvation. Claim us again as your beloved holy people. Quench our thirst, cleanse our hearts, wipe away every tear. To you, our beginning, our end, our shepherd and land, be honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving now and forever. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. of restoration you brought healing and hope to a man at the beautiful gate bring healing to our lives and help us to overcome the barriers that prevent people from experiencing healing wholeness and community we pray this in the name of your son jesus christ our lord amen you may be seated So far in Acts, last week we're in chapter one. We skipped over chapter two because that is the Pentecost passage in Acts, and we're going to put that on Pentecost, which I believe is May 19th. That is actually within the season. So we skip over chapter two, go into chapter three. Now, part of these, there's, there's two parts of chapter. One of these parts is not used in worship part at all in the Revised Common Lection, and one of them is. The second part is. The first part is not. And so what it in, includes is, is right after Pentecost, a day or so afterwards, uh, Peter and John are going to the temple for daily prayer. Now, we have to take note of this for just a second. Somehow we went from crucifying Jesus and all the disciples running for them lives, worried about, you know, associating with Jesus, sequestered in upper rooms, uh, you know, worried about persecution, receiving the Holy Spirit, the ascension. So we're about 40, 50 days or so after Jesus' death and resurrection. And the disciples, two of them, Peter, who is like the disciple in some ways, and John, the beloved disciple, are willing to and free to kind of just go back into the temple. Now, there is a lot of like myth and legend about how persecuted the disciples were. And some of it's true. There are places in the scriptures where the disciples could not freely participate in worship life and in community, get in debates, and even Stephen gets stoned. But yet, 60 days or so right after all this, Peter and John are freely walking into the temple. Now this says two things. One, that the persecution of Christians was at least not all the time. 
There was, it was sporadic. It came and it went. It was not something that was, that they constantly lived in fear at all times and all spaces. That the idea that two of the main disciples, the most known disciples at the time, were freely going into a place of worship, the temple in Jerusalem, 60 days after the crucifixion and, and just right after the gift of the Pentecost, is a sign that they're either boldened or that they were actually free to participate. The other thing that this is a sign of is that Christianity as we know it today is really an infant thing. There was no such thing as like Christianity. The church first became the way, which was a Jewish sect, and then Christianity became a thing well into many years after this. And that the early disciples practiced Judaism. They went to the temple, they practiced daily prayers. They didn't sway too far away from the practice of Judaism. They actually went to the temple right after Pentecost, okay? And as far as we can tell from the scripture, they just went there to practice Judaism. There wasn't a protest. They weren't turning over tables. They were just going to worship. So this says two things. One, there wasn't probably widespread persecution at this moment, that they were free to do it, and that, for one, they weren't trying to always, all the time, revolutionize everything. Sometimes they just went to worship. So they went into worship. Now, uh, during, during the afternoon prayers, many people would, uh, who needed help or got help went to this, the sidelines of the street, the, the, the beautiful gate that's mentioned here. This was normal. When you would walk in to participate, there were people there asking for money, asking for resources, like getting on the belt line off of Monona. They could, this is something that's understood. Um, and so usually you would come to worship with some form of resource, right? There's money changes for a reason. You would come and give offering of some fashion. So it was an opportunity. And so these two disciples joining the throngs of, throngs of people just going in for worship, see the beggars there. And so one there who's been uh, immobile for the, the whole life is doing what he usually does, and they have an encounter. They see each other on there. They say, we, offer, we don't have gold or silver to offer, which is a little weird because you would usually bring something to church. <laughs> but they didn't have that, but I will give you what I can or what I have. And they healed the, the leper there, uh, not the leper, the, the lame person there. Now this causes a stir, a good stir. No one's mad at them for doing this, right? And so they go into the temple. So the second part of this passage is, is Peter in the temple, and it's about half of his sermon. And unfortunately, this passage has been used for generations to support anti-Semitistic kind of movements. Because Peter says, like, you Israelites, you killed Jesus, you know, what have you done kind of stuff. But we also have to realize that Peter's never been a saint himself. You know, Peter is, Peter is technically an Israelite still. Even if he's saying you, he is one of them and will always be one of them, even as a Christ-following one. And guess who betrayed Jesus just a few chapters ago, right? Guess who took a sword and cut off a person's ear? This guy. So this is a really unfortunate use of this passage, this idea that Peter is somehow speaking in some form of holier than thou, like somehow he's better. So when you read, when you hear this, I would say, think of it more like a sober person speaking to someone who's still addicted. Like, he's been through it. He's someone that has experienced it, knows himself, has a better understanding of himself, and has been transformed or sobered by the Holy Spirit and the gift of the church. So he's speaking to his comrades, his people, people like him, about the gift that he has received because he's been there. He's gone through it. Not as a sense of superiority, but a sense of what we can hold in common. Now, what's really powerful about this statement is it's the first statement of the church. The Holy Spirit shows up in the chapter before. That's like the beginning of the church for us. 
And so the first statement of the church is what does it have to offer? What does the church have to offer? We prepare to hear the reading. reading today is from Acts chapter 3. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. The Gospel of the Lord. don't have silver and gold, but what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up. First, I love the joy in this passage. And I realize that no matter how hard life can get and how hard things can be, the abundant joy of the healed one has to be noted. I realize if I don't find joy, even in the darkest times, I know my faith struggles to live. It's part of the abundant life of my faith, finding joy in even the most hardest, darkest times. So what does it mean to be the church? Or what does the church have to offer? This is a hard question for people of faith. It's a hard situation 
and particularly now as everything is shifting around the church. The appetite for communities of faith from younger generations to older generations, to church institutions with budgets, buildings, and people. What do we have to offer? Now, back in the day when all these churches were built on each one of these corners, the, the perfected purpose of each church was pretty understood. If you, let's say, were Swedish and you moved to the area, you would find a Swedish-speaking, probably Lutheran church, you would go there. And when you went there, you received your first initial education and in, in orientation into the community, probably a mentor, maybe even your first job in your community, probably even your health care, right? Most of the churches started from religious institutions creating healthful situations. From anything up to your college and all your education, the beginning of our communities was rooted in the congregation. And you know, if you went to the church, you got darn near everything. It started there. You community started. No matter what you thought about Jesus or believed in Jesus, the church became the center stronghold of culture, creed, and opportunity for any immigrating person to the region. Because at that point, there wasn't, you know, any other softball leagues but the church. There wasn't any bowling leagues but the church. There wasn't any other social outlet than what the church was having outlet. All that came well into the development of America around us. I don't know if we even have a hospital in Madison anymore, really. Maybe Merida, right? Kind of. Kind of. Right? Everything has shifted. What does the church have to offer now? Why does it still matter? I think it's really powerful that after one of the most important times of the church, that is Pentecost, Jesus ascends into heaven. They come together in the upper room. The Holy Spirit breaks down the doors, blows open the windows, and it goes on their head, and they're able to speak in tongues and talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. But even this unique opportunity, these renewed, rejuvenated, faithful people went back to church, went back to their roots, back where it started for them. Daily prayer in the temple. And as they were walking in, presumably as free as anyone else, walking back into the temple, they saw an opportunity on the side of the road. Now, there is no right or wrong thing about giving or not giving to people who ask for money on the side of the road. That's up to you, your piety, what you value. I'm not going to preach a certain thing up here. I'm extremely inconsistent myself. But one of the things I was told once was someone who used to do that and was able to break the cycle for themselves was, again, do what you want or will when you see people asking for money on the street side. But if you're able and you feel safe, make eye contact, smile, wave if you can. Because at a minimum, they want to be seen. They want to know that they exist. All they see are headlights, blank stares, and people driving by. The idea that they want to be known and seen goes as far as any kind of offering that happens that day. And we see that in today's passage. They are walking on the street, going up into the beautiful gate, the beautiful, and probably marching with a bunch of other Jewish people going to do the same thing, while the voices of the needy are literally standing beside them, probably not even seeing or hearing or addressing them, eyes forward, hands on the wheel. Ultimately, Peter and John look. 
And Luke writes it really interestingly, looks intently, not just a side glance, but a deep power of acknowledgement of the situation. Even says it out loud, look at us. And the person chooses to look back intently, desiring something. Now, obviously, they're looking for resources, but they didn't quite know what was going to come. And Jesus, and, and the, Peter goes, I do not have silver or gold, but what I have, what I've been given, what the Holy Spirit enlivened a day ago, and what Jesus empowered in the ascension, in the faith that I have given, that has been given to me, even in my failings and in my faults, all that I have, I give to you. Through Jesus Christ of Nazareth, which is again the most simple name for Jesus, he would get, stand up. And Luke, the writer, goes out of his way, say the dude is leaping. He's leaping. The guy's skipping. He writes it like twice at least. He jumps up leaping and doesn't thank Peter and John, the people who looked and saw him, but he thanked God. He understood the source. He understood the place in which the grace is coming from. He didn't mistake the tool with the source and the healing. Now, as I've said in sermons before, I love healing passages in the Bible. But if we get just caught up on the thing that how cool the healing is, and it's cool, they're awesome. But the healings are always a tool of teaching. They're always a tool of grace and hope. Whenever there's a healing, there's always some kind of chapter two of faith, hope, and aspiration. And so when he is healed, he one thanks God, faith is the product of the healing. Faith is the product of healing and enters into community. He doesn't go and shows himself to the priest. He doesn't go home. He doesn't go and brag to the friends that are not healed around him because guess what? There's still people begging, right? He gets up, leaps for joy, and clings on to Peter and John. Now, not surprisingly, it causes a ruckus. And everything we should see in this passage is kind of a good ruckus. Hey, what's going on? Who are you guys? What's going on over here? And so Peter gets into this sermon. And again, he's preaching to a, a familiar person. He's preaching to himself in the third person in a way. Because he has denied Jesus. He, is, he has been called Satan and, and the rock in the same sentence. Him and Jesus have been around the block and they know each other and he knows, Jesus knows him and he knows them. And, and, and he does not have the greatest backstory of faithfulness. Drowning in the waters, all these times, right? But he's been through it. He's now get, he gets the privilege of being on the other side. He is someone with the Holy Spirit. He is someone that has saw Christ walking in the, and resurrected and ascended. He has been, he's now on the other side and has that story to tell. Not because he's better, not because he's more skilled, because the dude's not a great talker, actually. He is in the book of Acts. But before then, not really. He has been through it. And he preaches like he's been through it. Now, the last kind of phrase here in the second part uses the word perfect, which is kind of an unfortunate translation, in my opinion, mostly because of how we understand perfect. Because I don't know about you, but I actually kind of just don't like that word at all. Perfect is an idea it's an ideal. It is something that doesn't seem achievable in any way. Perfection is something that I think that we hold over people, hold over ourselves. 
that somehow we have to reach some kind of plateau as church or as human, that somehow perfect is the, where we're supposed to be heading. Now, the actual literation of the word is not really perfect. It's more like purpose. The person in full health will be able to be purposed, right? They will be able to live into their full self. Once they have had faith in God, once they've been given by the Holy Spirit, they don't reach some kind of ideal, but they're activated in purpose. It's just like the word good in Hebrew. When in the chap- first chapter of Genesis, when he says this is good, over and over it's more suited for its purpose. Here, perfect is another understanding that they get, they're able to be activated. Because he was healed and brought to full health, he was able to be activated as his full self. Not in some kind of ideal, but as a gifted person, as an opportunity. I think we are, as a church, like a healed person, given purpose and an opportunity, not as some form of ideal, but as an aspiration of joy and hope. We are not the first place people go after they move into the neighborhood. Got to change your license, get your kids in the schools, change over your doctors, probably fix the 800 things that you need to fix in your home because it's a 100-year-old home already, right? And, but the reality is the church still has what it has to offer into this day's passage. We may not have all the resources We may not have the best programming. We may not have the best social groups. We may not have the best anything. We don't have the perfected church. We will never be and never have been a perfected community. But we have been purposed. We have been created with this perfect purpose to heal from our own wounds, to heal the community of their wounds, to be a word of liberation and hope to restore a community. We are a restorative fact in the community for ourselves and each other. That is the foundation of who we are. We are restorative in our faith. We are, we are here to strengthen our own spiritual ankles, to restore our joy and our hope and to cling to each other and to the grace of God and do it every Sunday over and over again. Why? Because the rest of our lives we get torn down, throw to the edge of the road and lose our hope. Everything else wants to tear us down, wants us to more purchase more things, wants us to be live up to some ideal understanding of perfect, wants to continue to, to uh, consume us as employees, right? Or whatever it may be. The rest of our life does generally struggles to build us up. We have a unique opportunity as a church to be a grace-filled organization that will constantly be able to build each other up over and over again, restoring us as a community through the grace of God. And to be able to do it in such hope that we can go in and out of this place leaping with the aspiration of what's next. Leaping into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the rest of the week. Even though it may hurt or may be struggles. We still have that church. We have that purpose. Like day one. That doesn't, that whatever, how, that doesn't, you know, limit our, our ability to provide programming is limit. Our ability, none of that limits the ability of the abundant joy that we can and do give by being this type of purposed community. We may, we may not be the center of society anymore. We may have trouble with generational faith as our kids have had trouble finding their way through the world and may not think that church may be the foundation of their lives. That does not stop what we do. 
that does not stop who we are and what our purpose is. Because we may not have the silver and gold, all that beauty from your years past, but we still have a proclamation that restores each other, restores ourselves, restores the community, restores the joy of living, restores us in the perfected life of purpose and aspiration. It gives you a place to be. My son preached in a church last week. Guess what? He's doing it again today. It's the same sermon. I wish I had that luxury. (laughs) That was not my purpose for him. And that's still not the purpose he sees in himself. But the reason why he said, the reason why he has two churches is because there weren't enough to stand up for the communities that were wanting students. He just said yes. And then the community purposed him again, gave him a chance to do the same sermon again, right near when I'm talking here. The church looked to him and said, you are given the purpose, Mr. Scientist, the ecological person. It wasn't in my I can't, I can't tell people to become pastor nowadays. It's expensive. It's years worth of training, and the church is hard to function in the way it was. Everything has to change right now to make this, make it to be more sustainable. But my son keeps on saying yes to that purpose in his context with his gifts. I think he's still gonna be a scientist, but he might be a really good church member someday, somewhere in the community he chooses. And that's all the promise of this passage is, that we will constantly restore each other and be restored as a community, that we will constantly restore a church, whatever it may look like, and be constantly restored by the grace of God into the joy of redeeming, remembering our failings, but using our story to lift up others saying that we've been there, done that, have the t-shirt, and have gone on to the other side. Renewed, restored by the faith in Jesus Christ. It may all look different, and it will. But as we keep on saying yes to the purpose of God, we are renewed, restored, and sent out. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us confess our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. God, our Holy One, you feed our deepest hungers and heal our deepest needs. As we share in this community, this meal, the body and blood of Jesus, lead us to share all that we have and to find in generosity the beauty of abundant life and joy. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, our creator, you bring forth all life on earth. You have perfected it with purpose. Calm the storms, bring water to parched places, and protect the climate that this planet would be sustained life and sustained in all its variety. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, our Savior, you offer wisdom and guidance beyond all human knowledge. Instruct lawmakers, judges, elected officials, and all who make decisions. Help them to be grounded in your justice and care for all people. Merciful God. O oh God, our elder, you care for all your children. Encourage those who are in times of transition, facing loss, of old ways, of routines, those who are anticipating change. Guide those who journey in grief, hope, and uncertainty. We pray for those on our prayer page. Merciful God. O oh God, our center, God, our past, future, and present, you bring all people together. Help us to remember your identity and purpose in our ministry. Move us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to share in the beloved community that which we have. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Share a moment of peace with our neighbors.
Oh, I would hurt myself on skates. That would be for your entertainment and my demise. I don't know how kids use that roller shoes. Like, oh my gosh, that just looks painful. All right, let the distraction stop. Everybody stand as you're able. Generous God, in this meal you offer your very self. We give thanks for these gifts of the earth and the breaking of this bread revealed to us the risen one. In the pouring out of this wine, pour us out into service to the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's indeed, our, it's indeed right, our duty and our joy that we should all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true passion of a lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought to us eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. So to you, O God of the universe, your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures from age to age. In the night in which he betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all the drink, saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember the Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mysteries of faith. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Thank you. you may be seated. At Lake Edge, we practice communion at the rail. We either bread, bread, regular bread or gluten-free wafer. Kneel or stand at the rail. Receive uh, wine or grape juice. Wine is the dark liquid. Grape juice is the light liquid. Communion is and for and with everyone. All are welcome to come forward.
Please stand as you're able. Gracious God, in you we live and move and have our being. With your word and this meal of grace, you have nourished our life together, strengthened us to show your love and serve the world in Jesus' name. Amen. For now, thank you, Tarsus and Tim, in celebration of your parents' birthdays and these flowers. Gary and Yvonne, over here. Thank you very much for being part of our flower ministry and your memory, and Ed and Ava as well. Uh, after worship, down in the adult education room, we're going to continue the conversation started on Monday night when it comes to become a dementia-friendly institution. We got kind of the initial re, uh, retraining, and we're going to continue that conversation informal. There's no presentation, just to keep the conversation going, keep it fresh on our, in our heart here at our congregation, how we can be more friendly to people with dementia and related illnesses. So that is right after our worship service today, downstairs in our adult faith formation room. Um, there's, a, there's an article in the, the announcements here, How to Improve Your Brain Health, that also goes along with that as well. Big thanks to the Healing House chefs, and also to anyone who showed up yesterday to help clean up on the grounds, and all the work and all the mulch moved for that. Thank you everyone for doing that on behalf of the church. Um, we're updating the photos in our directory. I think the latest photos were from 2018 or further, right? A lot has changed since then. So update your photos. Maybe you don't want a new photo. Maybe everybody wants to just go back to 2018. I don't know. But we're trying to update our records to make sure it's as, as current and as recent as we possibly can. Um, and please be a part of that ministry here. Forte's Bible Studies. Um, I'm in an anti-racism training for the next month on Tuesdays in the morning. So. Uh, for the next month until uh, we'll be back to doing two on May 14th. But for now, in the next four Tuesdays, there will be no 1030 foretaste. So five o'clock only foretaste Bible studies for the next four weeks. Um, any other thing for the good of our group? All right. Let us stand and receive the charge and benediction. Like Christ has arisen, we too arise. We are lifted from this place and into the world in, in need of a risen life. We have transformed, we have been transformed as a lifted people, given this ground to move on, given this air to breathe, and given a mission to work on. We are lifted, not only for our own good, but for the good of the world. Go from this place, fueled by the risen life of Christ. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Thanks be to God.